Anybody uh, climb mountains here? I hike mountains. You hike mountains? <laughs> yeah? My rule is if it doesn't require crampons or rope, I'll do it. All right. So that doesn't really count as climbing. So no, so, no, so no one's climbed Mount Hood. There we go. <laughs> How about Rainier? Denali? Have you heard of Everest? <laughs> I'm sure you have. See, I've been on Helens because that didn't require crampons. <laughs> So Everest, there's a certain point at Everest um, where you're at approximately 28,000 feet. At 28,000 feet, you can barely breathe. There is really no oxygen up there. There's a few people that have climbed it without oxygen, but most people use oxygen. Um, there's a section, well, basically at 28,000 feet, you're in the death zone. You're in a timer. And if you don't get up to the top in a certain amount of time, you die. And there are people up there and those bodies stay up there. They don't come down. It's, it's not like in the military where you, you leave the man behind. You, you just can't bring these people down. Um, so they're just permanent bodies up there on this, this mountain. And the one area that causes a lot of these uh, deaths is a section called Hillary's Step. Hillary's Step is basically a funnel on the mountain. And there are times in peak season where Hillary's Step basically becomes like Highway 26. And uh, that's usually when Mount uh, Everest hits the news and, and someone dies. So basically what I'm going to run through here is ways to avoid Hillary's step uh, when you are implementing SD-WAN. So I'm going to give you some, some ideas, some experience that I've had uh, implementing this technology really over the past three to four years. So um, we have uh, implemented it successfully but it's been an, a very much of an iterative process. Uh, several false starts, um, but you know, over time we kind of found where we needed to do and how we needed to do it. And um, that has been a partnership. Uh, Aaron Edwards has been part of that journey. Uh, Palo Alto Networks also have been part of that journey. Um, and even Equinex, we, we, uh, we do some work with Equinex as well. So it's not like Columbia Sportswear did this alone. This is uh, truly um, a success that's built on, on, on partnership. So with that, let's, uh, let's start off. Um, next slide. That's me, John Spiegel. I am the Senior Manager for Infrastructure. Um, un informally, I call myself the, uh, the grand poobah of all blinky lights, whether they're physical or virtual at Columbia Sportswear. Uh, if they has a blinky light, I, I own it and I'm responsible for it. I'm accountable for it, and my boss likes to tell me that all the time. Um, you can hit me up on Twitter if you want to, jspeak76, uh, LinkedIn, fine, email, email me, fine. Um, I also work for this fine lady. You probably know who she is, Gert Boyle. Um, she is actually in the office a lot, so we, we see her often. Uh, but I do need to have one more click here. I do need to call this out. Um, if I say anything outrageous that you disagree with, you can go to her, but she's going to totally disclaim me. So um, all these opinions and everything in here is mine. It's mine alone. It doesn't represent Columbia Sportswear. It doesn't represent Gert Boyle, uh, Tim Boyle, or any of the Boyle family. Um, so anyway, let's go on. Uh, agenda really uh, for tonight is why SD-WAN? What makes SD-WAN uh, one of these fundamental technologies that you, you need to really take a deep dive onto. So I'll provide you my thoughts on why SD-WAN, uh, and then we'll uh, talk about four routes to success. How do we avoid Hillary's step in our journey on SD-WAN? Uh, and then we'll do some QA. Um, I'm trying to keep this, this presentation less technical, so we're not going to dive into bytes, bits, packets, flows, uh, technologies, policies, those sorts of things. I'm not going to uncover all of that. I'm going to try to keep it on a higher level, uh, management level, executive level, uh, so you kind of understand some of the challenges we went through, how we overcame them, and hopefully give you some advice. So let's go to the next slide. So here's your router in 2020. I don't know, it's what, three or four months away? If you've got a conventional router, this is pretty much what it's worth these days. And there's a reason for that. Um, next slide. What you're dealing with in, your, mo in your, your legacy networks is this. It's bits and bytes. When you go down and talk to the network team, what are they talking about? They're talking about ping. They're talking about zeros. They're talking about ones, packets in and out. Um, that used to work. It was great when all your applications were in the data center. The problem now is that your applications 
are no longer in your data center. Your data has been moved out of your data centers. It's now about centers of data. And those centers of data have gravity. Uh, in order to get to those centers of data, you need something different. So um, it's really, again, about the application, less about the bits and bytes and those um, incredibly expensive routers we all used to buy. So let's go on to the next slide. Here's the problem, and I'm just kind of go into a little more detail of why this is a challenge. Um, typical network, uh, this looks very much like our old retail network, uh, uh, say three or four years ago. Uh, we would have an, a, a telecom line, so MPLS, one of your major providers, pick one, AT&T, Sprint, Verizon, whoever else, CenturyLink, uh, would be the main provider for that service. All of that technology here, all the, the, the network connectivity would go back to your data center, and you would pay a bundle of money for that. Um, internet lines. Uh, we would use internet lines, but really it was kind of a secondary technology. Um, maybe browse a little bit, but most of the data all went back to the data center. So it was nice to have, and it was nice to have in a backup when that MPLS line failed. Um, the challenge with that, and let's click a little bit more, is these systems are expensive to operate. Um, they are labor intensive. You have to employ some pretty high-end talent. Uh, we have a CCIE on staff. They don't come cheap. Um, so, you know, you got to have people that are just can dive deep into this technology. Um, the other challenges you have is you have proprietary vendors. They want to hook you in. They want to make sure you are using their technology and only their technology. And when you try to get off their technology, it's really hard to do that. Um, additionally, you have these telecom providers that are providing you MPLS and uh, expensive, low bandwidth. And every three years, you got to renegotiate the contract. So you have this conversation with your rep, uh, and then you go out and you get two bids from another company, and you're thinking like, whoa, I got a really good deal here. I could move over to this other provider, uh, save myself some money, and then you figure out that the cost to move over to the other provider is going to probably take most of your savings out. And it's also another time-intensive project that your company doesn't want to do. So you never really change the provider. You just kind of deal with it. Um, maybe you save some money, maybe you don't. Um, the other pieces are innovation. These networks of the past, there really was no innovation in them. Uh, what you got is when you buy a new router, means you got a new router. It had a new chip in it. Great. But did it have any, had any new innovation in it? Not really. It's just a little faster, a uh, little more expensive, um, same way to operate it, but you really didn't get any benefit out of it. So why would you change out? Um, you didn't really want to do it. The other big piece here is that none of this network is not cloud ready. It does not have an answer for Okta, does not have an answer for O365, email, uh, Azure, um, trying to run MPLS to one of these clouds. You couldn't do it. It's expensive. It's not really great. Uh, and you need to spend a lot of time on the internet lines and you don't get any application performance. So how do you know that, uh, say for instance, your Azure AD is, is, is the problem, that that's the delay and it's not the network. Uh, your network team is constantly firefighting. They're always trying to find how can they be innocent of this when they can't prove anything because these networks won't give you that telemetry. They won't give you that information. So um, these are some of the challenges with these legacy networks and that's why your router, if you still have one, uh, from a major vendor and you're not looking at SD-WAN, it's going to be a brick next year. So let's move on to the next. So how can we improve? Um, and this is a challenge that we looked at. Uh, we had this very problem. Our applications were moving to the cloud. Uh, we were an early adopter of O365. Uh, we have uh, Salesforce. We have SaaS applications. We've now gotten into PaaS. We've moved on to uh, data lakes, Azure uh, Databricks, and more recently, we have deployed our retail stores with a cloud-based application based on Dynamics 365. None of that lives in the data center, not anymore. So how can I take that network from the past and bring it forward? On top of that, it's expensive to operate, um, to deploy, very difficult, a lot of CLIs, was not automated. Um, and I think we ran a number at one point where it took almost 120 hours to bring us a retail store online. Um, a ridiculous amount of time and uh, uh, very uh, frustrating when the business wants things on demand. 
So um, we took it upon ourselves to look at how we, could, how we could improve. And one of the ways that we determined that would help us out is looking into this technology called SD-WAN. So if we go to the next slide. SD-WAN is really a cloud-first WAN design. So we're leveraging no longer MPLS. We could use MPLS, but we don't leverage it directly. We can leverage the internet to provide applications, um, whether it be Azure, Dynamics, O365, Facebook, or your legacy file and print, or if you decide to do your payment settlement systems uh, within your data center or outside of your data center, doesn't really matter, or you have your SAP ERP system within your data center, it can, it can account for all of that. So how does it do it? Next slide. Simple devices. This is another piece. These complex routers of the past are now replaced by these simple devices, uh, which also helps reduce some of the cost. But the key piece here is this controller. All of the, and, and Aaron mentioned this, all of the control of these networks, all the management plane, let's call it that, exists in this controller. That's a powerful thing because you can tap into that controller and do all cool things like you know, Prisma or um, we're looking at some, doing something with PagerDuty where it's a simple API call into that controller and um, you can basically connect in your SD-WAN devices, your network devices in, in a way you never could in the past. Um, you can also pull telemetry from it very easily and put that into a Slack command uh, in a chat bot and operationalize your work. So uh, hugely powerful. The other key piece it gives you is this simple network device. No longer do you need this hunk of iron that has you know multiple chips in it. Um, the device becomes very simple, very easy to deploy. If you can even choose to deploy it on an x86 server if you cho cho choose to do that. Um, from transport perspective, we can now use more than just MPLS. Uh, MPLS can be part of the equation, but the big piece becomes internet. Um, and on top of that, um, I think you've all heard about LTE 5. Uh, it's coming out, it's gonna be pretty darn fast. You can start to leverage LTE. So in an instance where you don't get uh, a line installed in time, you can leverage LTE or um, you get an outage and uh, these things happen, you, cable gets cut, uh, backhoes happen. Um, LTE can come to you the rescue and, and, and the performance just keeps improving. So let's, next slide. Uh, application-based WAN, so now we have, uh, you know, cloud is available to us. We can hit our data centers. Um, we can uh, account for both, both ways. Next slide, please. So really, what do we have? Whoop, one more back. Uh, simplified management, internet is your first class, uh, and then also uh, modular. Uh, this is another key piece. Um, we designed our network in such a way that we weren't dependent upon a single vendor. Uh, if needed, uh, because it's all software, right? It's not proprietary across the board. If needed, um, we could change out our firewall vendor or we could change out our SD-WAN vendor um, if they're not performing or even our local area network vendor. Uh, we wanted to have control. We wanted to have uh, a way to hold our vendors accountable. So when we designed out this network, we had that in mind. All right, so let's talk about Denali, uh, or not, I'm sorry, Denali or Everest. Um, up there, that is Hillary's step, right up there, right there. So we're gonna talk about ways, uh, lessons we have learned uh, over our journey uh, over the last four years to help you be successful with SD-WAN. Climbing device number one, assess your organization. I think this is probably the most critical thing that you will encounter um, in your journey to SD-WAN. It is a transformation of your team. Cloud and uh, all the services associated with it are changing the way IT was done. In the past, it was a very siloed approach. Uh, you had a gentleman that did networking, you maybe had a lady that did servers, and um, maybe somebody else that did storage, and they all kind of had to work together in succession. In cloud, that's no longer the case. Um, you have to be competent in each one of those areas to understand how an application is put together, how an application performance uh, is impacted by the decisions you make uh, in, in cloud, in IaaS. Um, you also have to be understanding of the network if you're deploying a SaaS application. How do you know that it's not the network or the SaaS application or the SaaS application has some backend job, some SQL query that's causing everything to slow down? These are the critical things that you need to understand. And when you build out your team, 
they're going to have to change the ways they operate and they're going to have to operate together. So start with your organization. Um, this is another critical piece. This is from Gartner. 96% of IO teams are not ready for cloud. This is something really to pay attention to um, because this team dynamics will uh, sync or make your project successful. So pay attention to that. The next piece is very important too. You guys are all leaders. You're all the people that everyone looks to to make decisions, to set the tone, um, to make you know, people uh, successful. Um, leadership in a digital age isn't command and control. It's no longer you tell somebody what to do and they may do it. You actually have to build teams. And these teams are not teams that are formed for a long period of time. These are teams that are formed for a reason, for a short period of time, and then they, um, they reform into other teams. Um, a great book, if you want to check it out, read it, is called uh, Stanley McChrystal's uh, Team of Teams. Uh, it is it, mind changing, and, and, and he tells the story about how they, uh, deter how they were working in Iraq to find all the, uh, the terrorists in Iraq. And um, the approach they were using in the past was very command and control. And until they kind of changed this team of teams approach, uh, that was really the, the main difference. It is also true in business as well. So as we move into this cloud era. So evolution of infrastructure teams, this is kind of how we are situated today at Columbia. Um, we are asked to do a lot of projects. And uh, as a result of those projects, uh, it bites into our ability to keep the lights on within our teams. Uh, so we made a conscious decision about 12 months ago to divide our teams in two uh, with one team focused on production, keep the lights on, and another team focused on projects. Um, and the reason for doing that is to cap out the capacity. But when we built that team, uh, that group, we also added in some other aspects of it. We decided to, to uh, move to more of an agile approach, so adopt some of the philosophies of DevOps, um, focused on partnering, and then automation came in. Um, but as we moved into the future, as cloud becomes more of a reality and more of a, more of our applications move out of our data center, that's just not going to work. So we're starting to explore what does that team look like in the future? How do we evolve it and constantly keep uh, adjusting our course of action? So future looks more like this. Um, we're going to be more focused on changing some of these engineers into uh, uh, systems reliability engineers. Um, they will be focused on keep the lights on. They won't be focused on a single application. Uh, they'll be focused on multiple applications and being moved throughout the organization, almost like a, a guild, you could say, of, um, of professional engineers. Uh, the second group is gonna be more of your infrastructure software engineers. Keyword here, not infrastructure engineers, infrastructure software engineers. Software is eating the world. Uh, and that is so true in infrastructure these days. So when you talk to your, 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 your engineers as they're coming up in the organization, they want to be software competent. They want to be able to write code. They want to be uh, understand automation uh, is absolutely critical, critical to them. Additionally, as I mentioned, they want to be more than just a network engineer or a platform engineer or a storage engineer. They want to be basically competent in all these different areas. Um, that's how they will be successful. Uh, and the other piece is um, they need to become almost tech evangelists. They need to understand the technology. They need to be able to translate the technology into business outcomes. Uh, so just focusing in deep into the technology won't be enough for these people. Um, they really need to become um, almost like a BA, a business analyst with uh, deep technical skills. So that will help them be successful because no longer will that technology be within the data center. They're not gonna be building servers. They're gonna be actually deploying these applications and uh, translating you know, what these uh, SaaS applications do for the business. So, um, yeah. Question about that. Yeah. When we moved from your previous infrastructure team to this to 2018 to 2020X sure. version, um, did you have to, in, to go to keep the lights on and project focus? Did you have to add people or did you just kind of reassign people you find that you're doing, yeah. you were doing less keep the lights on because yeah. there's less data center stuff and so those people that become project companies. Yeah, our approach was really to keep the same level of staff. It wasn't to augment our staff. Our challenge was really the technical debt. So over time, because we were so focused on projects, things kind of 
didn't get taken care of in the way they could. A great example of that is we had a technology called OTV. I'm familiar with this, with this one. Basically, it's a technology that stretches VLANs between data centers. Uh, originally was designed or brought into the organization um, because um, the server team wanted to move servers uh, between data centers for DR purposes without changing IP addresses. So we brought in this technology. It worked, sort of. Um, about every eight or nine months, we would have an outage. Uh, because it, it basically what would happen in one data center would transfer into the next data center. Um, but we didn't really have a lot of time to, to fix it. And it was only until we like, did a focused effort to, to fix that uh, were we able to kind of resolve that and we've fixed it since then. Um, but it builds up over time. You know, if you don't keep up to date on your patches, you don't keep up to date on your VMware, these things build over time and they cause outages. So um, we've been very cognizant on, on you know, making sure the Keep the Lights On team is focused on that uh, and also resolving tickets, uh, but also really being very regimented with the business and saying we only have so much capacity because you know we understand everything's a priority one in terms of a project, um, but we can only do so much. So does, does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. Okay, yes. John, did you have any attrition and to what extent you brought people from the outside? We did have a slight amount of attrition, of, of attrition. Um, but uh, basically what we did is, is sometimes those were senior level engineers. We made a conscious decision to not backfill that with a, with a senior level engineer. We basically went to our, our uh, leadership and said, hey, we have a great opportunity here to bring in some young folks into the organization or some folks that don't have a lot of experience. So we would basically take that senior level en engineer or senior level platform person uh, and trade them for two young people. We had a really good success on our network team doing that. Um, one of our senior uh, engineers, he got a great opportunity at another company, left us. Um, we brought in two young people. One of them was just recently discharged from the Air Force. Um, just a little bit of, of infrastructure technology knowledge. Another uh, lady that we brought in, uh, she had just started her classes at uh, what was it, Mount Hood Community College, uh, CCNA training. So we brought them in, uh, and we've also created this, this environment of mentoring. Uh, all the senior engineers, one of the most important things they can do is mentor a young person or somebody new to the organization. Um, within three or four months, we had these two engineers that were recently um, brought onto the team. They were deploying SD-WAN to our European organizations. Uh, and it got to the point where they were so competent in the, in the technology that one of the CCIE resources um, he's a super smart guy. He got uh, to the point where he was, I don't know, jealous maybe, uh, but he was very interested in what they were doing. And uh, so they were deploying this location in Germany and um, as, as a joint team. And they almost, they were on a WebEx and they, and they started to kind of uh, argue amongst themselves about the next step. And the CCI was adamant that he had the right answer to the problem. Uh, whereas the other two were like, no, no, we've done this before. Um, and uh, so he finally relented and found out that he was wrong about the situation. So these people, you know, had been in the job for maybe six months, worked on this new technology, uh, a much simpler technology, you know, basically schooled the, the CCIE. So um, it's an evolution. So keep that in mind. Uh, team is so important. Culture is so important with your with your, uh, your your teams that that will make you successful. All right, climbing device number two. Watch out for the underlay. This is going to be a critical piece in your journey. Um, the underlay, if you're not familiar with it, is all the internet lines, uh, the MPLS, the LTE, everything that goes together uh, to make your SD WAN journey successful, or just uh, utter failure, or will drive you crazy. Um, which it does a lot because you have to work with these people called the telcos and uh, working with them doesn't really improve. Next click. It actually, it gets worse uh, because instead of dealing with just one telco, you're dealing with, I think in my case, about 20 of them. <laughs> and it's like herding cats. Um, and you can have a situation where you have multiple telcos in a mall. Uh, and then you're also dealing with situations in the mall to get a line installed. It, it can be a very painful thing. So let's go to the next slide here. So transport options, 
These are some of the reasons why it's very important to pay attention here. MPLS, you could use MPLS. You can use internet. Um, next, managed service provider is another one. Uh, just having a managed service provider doesn't make things easier because you have to manage them now. Um, internet only is an option too, um, but internet only changes whether it's CenturyLink, AT&T, uh, Verizon, Comcast, Spectrum, Global something or other. There's so many of these guys out there and it's, it's all territorial. Um, you also have a choice to go hybrid, so you can throw all of this together um, and do all of the above. My recommendation here is click, get a Sherpa. <laughs> Go out, interview a bunch of people, interview a bunch of companies that are competent in this area and pick one. Um, it will save your life. I can tell you that uh, even today, uh, I was dealing with a situation in a new uh, uh, location we have in Charlotte. Um, we installed an internet line, thought we were good to go, got it up and running, DSL, found out that we could only get a VPN out of it. We're like, that's strange. We got the VPN, the VPN's connected back to the data center. Why can't we browse out? This is really strange. And dived a little bit further into it, found out that um, in order to get to the internet, you needed to click uh, uh, basically a, a user license page or uh, acceptable use page. Well, how do you do that in SD-WAN? You can't. So every time we tried to browse, hit this button. Basically had to call the provider and say, Come on, guys, <laughs> this is connected to an SD-WAN device. Um, you'll encounter strange little issues like that. If you can provide or you can find a really good company that really knows everything there is to, to uh, deal with getting an internet line installed, managing it, doing the outage work, uh, basically being your, your partner there, it's gonna make your life a lot easier. So uh, do yourself a, a good favor here, find a good Sherpa if you're gonna uh, do SD-WAN. Climbing device number three, automation. Um, if you're gonna dive into SD-WAN and just dive in and to do SD-WAN, um, that's okay, but this is the real key. Uh, teaching your team, getting your team involved in automation. Um, much of our journey has been successful because our partnership with Aaron here, Aaron's an incredible resource that we've leveraged uh, within our team to kind of uh, create this, this culture of automation um, that we've done. It really needs to be a core competency. So a few things you want to do and to get cloud ready, click one, stop. Okay, yeah, stop the, the CLIs. Um, too often than not, you're going to get your network engineer that's going to fall back to his old ways of doing things, and they're going to want to do everything out of the CLI. Just tell them to stop. Mm -hmm. stop. Stop hugging your CLI. And the same thing with the GUI. Um, really start to get them interested in automation frameworks. Ansible is a great one, an easy one. Uh, we use Chef a lot in the past. Um, Salt is another option. Um, get them to start thinking about programming. How do they become much more than just an, a software or a infrastructure engineer and more to that infrastructure software engineer uh, approach? Um, it will also help you on your, on your, your, your deployments as well. Um, how do you do that? Invest in boot camps. Training is critical. Um, every year we make sure our engineers get out and go to a training session. And it's not just going to VMware or Cisco or um, uh, folks are going to Ignite. We actually send them to Ansible Fest. Uh, we've sent them to, um, there's a monitoring uh, conference here. Uh, we sent another engineer to PyCon. So PyCon's a Python training. And, and these guys, they come back and gals, they come back. They're just energized, they're enthused, and they just spread that within the team and it catches on like wildfire. Um, the other piece we've had very good success on is creating a core automation team. So we dedicate some resources within the team to basically focus in on automation. So whenever another engineer has a challenge, um, they go to these folks and say, hey, you know, have you seen this? Is there something I can do to, you know, something you've seen before that you can leverage to help me out to get to uh, automating these tools? Um, and we've had really good success with that. And, and then these folks are very motivated. They're very excited about uh, automation. So it infects the entire team. And then empower these, this core automation uh, group to be evangelists. Uh, just because you're doing automation within your team, that's great. Uh, but we, what we've also seen is that these folks now go out to the business. They work with our application owners to help them automate 
their application. So uh, when uh, cloud comes to them, and if it does, great. But even within the data center, how do we automate our applications for a quicker recovery and consistency of, of, uh, of the application settings? So, um, yeah. Could you use an example of just even a quick example of something that you've automated? Are you talking specifically with your cloud genetic stuff mm -hmm. or just the network Absolutely. all the way through? Absolutely. Um, this is the one right here, chat ops. If you're not familiar with chat ops, uh, basically this is creating a bot uh, within Slack that you can execute commands. What this does is it, it helps you with day two. Um, when we deployed to our retail stores and, and transformed uh, the, the, the retail application within our, our stores, um, we had to do it in such a way that we didn't want to burden our engineers uh, 100% and um, run them through the gauntlet of you know, late nights for, for months on end. Um, and so we spent a lot of time thinking about how do we automate these things? How do we get it to the point where it can become an easy script that a operations person could run it? So um, we've probably spent about three weeks or three to six weeks um, going through automation frameworks and uh, uh, automating the uh, reconfiguration of the network for the Dynamics platform that we deployed. There was a, a significant amount um, and got it down to the point where we could have an operations person run these commands uh, very simply. And, and the effect of that was we got the same uh, results every time. So instead of having a, say, a level four engineer uh, focused on reconfiguring a device, it was just an operations person kicking off a command in Slack uh, and then getting a result back. We've also used it in troubleshooting as well. So um, if we have a site down or we're having performance problems, uh, they can, operations person can go into Slack, run a command and see the status of a site. Is LTE up? Is the network performing? Um, the next step is really uh, we're working on with Aaron as well is to um, provide application stats. So how is the application performing? Is the network a problem? Is the server response time spiking? Um, those are you know, key things that we can provide to our operations team, which reduces our involvement. Uh, and, and that's a nice thing on a weekend, right? If you're out <laughs> watching the Ducks game and, and you get a phone call, um, you, you, you know, if we can avoid that and, and, and put that into a, a chat ops type format, where it's very easy for an operations person to run, um, that's a really good thing. Does that help? Yeah, Perfect, cool. So get cloud ready. Um, climbing device number four. If you're ever gonna climb Everest, uh, there's a lot of training that you have to do. Uh, there's a lot of mountains that you have to climb. And most of the best organizations out there really want you to submit a resume that you are an accomplished person because when you get up to 28,000 feet, if you slow down, if you, you're not able to make it, no one's going to carry you down. You know, you're, you're going to, no one wants that on, on, on their, their dime that, uh, you know, they need to bring someone down because they may be risking one of their employees. So uh, in that vein, um, if you're going to look at SD-WAN and deploy it across a wide uh, swath of your company, do a lot of POCs. Take your time with this technology. Um, it took us probably four different designs to get to where we are today. Uh, and, and they're four basically different designs. Uh, so let's click. So let's put it all together. Um, POC a lot. So really what it's about is um, team dynamics. Make sure when you do these POCs, you get your team dynamics down because that's gonna tell you, are you gonna be successful or are you going to fail? These things come out pretty darn quickly if whether you have tensions within your team. Uh, so spend a lot of time on that. The next one is your network systems. Um, spend a lot of time looking at your network. What does your under underlay look like? Are you going to be all uh, internet? Are you going to use LTE? Are you going to use MPLS? Are you going to use all of those? Um, that's a key piece. Are you going to take my advice and get a Sherpa? Um, I re definitely recommend that. Um, so spend a lot of time on your network systems. Automation. Uh, during these POCs, don't leave out automation. A lot of the success that we had was due to the automation that we put in. Uh, we, we actually did about six sprints on our automation and, and got it down to a real clean, crisp result. So automation is, is critical here. And then day two, don't forget about day two. Just because you deploy SD-WAN and it's successful, it's not over with. Uh, there is day two support that will uh, come up again and again and again. If you spend the time up front, 
um, you'll have a much more successful result. So be very careful in this stage. Do a lot of POCs. Find some uh, edge cases. Uh, find some areas that um, you can test some of these uh, sites out and, and your designs out. Uh, we did our sales offices in North America initially in our design that eventually you know, rolled into retail and let that bake for you know, three or four months and just saw how the results were. And uh, once we kind of proved out that it worked and, and we could make that happen and, and be successful, and that's, that's when we started to go into our retail stores. All right. So I'll talk a little bit about our evolution and where we're at today and some of the results that we've had. <laughs> So this is kind of how we've approached um, SD-WAN for ourselves and, and some of the benefits that we've had. Um, we're basically moved now to a, a CloudGenix ION device. Um, we initially started with a virtualization. Basically, could we put everything on an x86 server, including our firewalls, including um, CloudGenix? Um, found that not to work. Um, Interestingly enough, we ran it for a year, but from an operational perspective, we just determined we couldn't support it. So we had to move back uh, a step and basically deploy the, the ION boxes from, from CloudGenix uh, in combination with uh, Palo Alto. And then we uh, initially uh, started deploying Aruba networks as well. All of those systems uh, cloud-based, so controllers in the cloud, uh, very API first, um, easy to make changes on. We've had really good success with that. In our retail stores, um, we're deploying broadband. So broadband could be from Comcast, could be from Spectrum, could be from CenturyLink, uh, basically whatever the location would uh, provide us. And we're in retail stores. These retail stores, uh, they can be out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, they could be on an Indian reservation, which has presented some challenges. Um, and trying to get clear, good bandwidth into these locations, you would think would be an easy thing. You know, today we have Comcast or Fios at home, and we get good bandwidth. Um, in retail locations, that's never the case. Um, we run into lots of big challenges. In fact, one location in Milpitas, California, um, the best bandwidth we could get was three megs, believe it or not, right next to Levi's Stadium. Um, and come to find out, after doing some digging, um, AT&T had lost the plans to their CEO. They didn't know where all the wires went. So. <laughs> So that was the best we could do, um, but we found a way around that one. Uh, but those are the types of challenges you're gonna encounter. And, and again, that's why I recommend the Sherpa. Uh, LTE is, is what we use as our backup. And sometimes we use it as the primary and there's some locations where we get some really good bandwidth on the LTE perspective. And then basically we connect into the cloud. So we've gone away from MPLS. We've gone away from uh, requiring us to go back to the data center. It is all cloud forward, all cloud based. Uh, for our retail stores today. So what are some of the advantages? Low TCO. Um, we've lowered our cost to operate these systems because now we don't require the CCI resource. We're using our, our desktop people, or not desktop, but our operations folks. We're using our junior engineers to run this, operate it, deploy it. Uh, op operational simplicity. We've uh, simplified this configuration. It's now infrastructure as code. Um, there isn't a lot of clicky clicky that goes on. It's all done through Python scripts, chat ops, those types of things. Um, we've also broke some three year cycles. So uh, in the past where we had to renegotiate that MPLS contract every 36 months, we no longer have to do that because it's all based on internet lines. Uh, and those internet lines uh, aren't through one provider, they're through multiple providers. So that gives us leverage when we have these conversations with these vendors. Uh, modular vendors, same thing applies here. Um, no longer are we tied to one vendor, uh, one ecosystem. Uh, we're now modular. So if, you know, for instance, um, we're not happy with our LAN provider or a wireless provider, we swap them out um, after two to three years. Uh, if we're not happy with our security provider, we can do the same. Um, that's, that's, some, that's very powerful for us. Yes. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, so I, I want to push into that a little bit. Yeah. Because how are you going to swap out CloudGenix or how are you going to swap out um, Palo Alto? I mean, it's not. Right. That's that whole thing where if you want to bring in a new firewall vendor or a new SD WAN vendor, it's right. going to require a little bit of work on your. I mean, you can swap out your broadband and your LTE. Really Absolutely. Quickly. Uh, but you're saying vendor agnostic, uh -huh. I don't really... Yeah, so, so let me, uh, which one do I want to pick here? 
uh, which, which vendor do I don't want to offend more? Um, <laughs> I'm going to go security this time. Sorry, sorry, JWeb. Sorry. Um, so for instance, if I wanted to swap out my Palo Alto firewalls in a retail store, um, I could leverage CloudGenix to do that through their Cloud Blades product. And I could bring in, for instance, Zscaler, or um, I think Cisco's got something similar right now, uh, and, and easily do that. So basically, it's pulling out the physical gear, lighting up the Cloud Blades, uh, and, and moving to Zscaler. Um, and doing that. That's, that's an easy way for me to swap it out. I could conversely get rid of my, my physical firewalls and, and go to Prisma as an option as well. Um, swapping out the, the Cloud Genix is probably a little bit harder, but it, it, it can be done uh, because basically what we're leveraging is internet. Uh, we're not tying back to our data center. We're not tying back to our MPLS networks. Um, it's just a matter of swapping out boxes and homing that back. So it, it is, is very possible. But if you're not purely cloud, I'm assuming retail spaces have to come back mm -hmm. via SD-WAN to the Certainly. site for something. Yep. So if you pull out a Cloud Genix at one site and put in Bigly for something, yeah. that's not necessarily going to play with the Cloud Genix. So now you have to build some sort of VPN tunnel. No, I mean, I build my VPN tunnel back to my data center and then, yeah. then shoehorn some routing tr you know, right. tricks in there. It, 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 it can be done. Yeah. Or, or it, we get to the point where we have agnostic site-to-site -site VPNs. So um, use IPsec VPNs to, to make it happen. It's, it's much more possible than it was, say, in the past. Yeah. yeah. But that's, that's one of the reasons why we went this route. Um, and then the other piece, obviously, cloud ready. So uh, we now have the ability to uh, basically determine, is it, is it the network team or is it the cloud application? And um, base, because it's software and we're getting telemetry off, off the controllers these days. So it's, it's really, really important. All right. So here's some of the results, um, and I'm pretty happy about these. So innovation, um, this is something that's not talked about. So if you remember back in the beginning of the presentation, I talked about um, getting a new router and, and, and not really getting a lot of innovation out of that. With SD-WAN, we're getting innovation. Just about every three months, there's some new feature, some new functionality uh, that comes to us, and, and it is a very useful technology. Um, and Aaron was in the office the other day and showed me a few new things that are coming out that are really interesting. Um, Cloud Blades is another example of that. Uh, with your physical routers of the past, you would never get an opportunity uh, to deploy something like that in a short amount of time. So uh, the innovation that we're seeing because we're working in software uh, is significant. Um, the other piece is, again, Cloud Ready, yeah. Uh, install and recovery. Because we've employed automation, uh, because this is API based, because we have controllers, uh, the time to restore a system is, is rapid. Um, basically, all you have to do is, is lay down the device, put the device in, it grabs a DHCP address, contacts the controller, your configuration is back. Uh, juxtapose that with uh, you know the old days where you had a CLI, you had Cisco show up, sorry, so I mentioned a vendor there. Um, you had, a, you had a, a resource show up, man in a van, it took him uh, maybe an hour or two and it involved a WebEx uh, to restore a system. Um, that's no longer the case with what we have today. Uh, the installation's also much faster. So in the past, it took us about 120 hours to deploy a retail store. We're now down from uh, touching the equipment uh, down to less than five hours. In some cases, we can do it in about 60 minutes, uh, an optimal period. So huge improvement. And that includes not only the CloudGenix piece, um, but the Aruba networks, uh, and also uh, recently we, we got the firewalls down super fast too uh, due to one of our scripting gurus. So um, we're seeing huge, huge, huge differences in the amount of time it takes to deploy a store. And uh, that puts our engineers um, basically adding value to the business as opposed to configuring gear. Um, return on investment. Um, we saw our return on investment in about eight months. Um, and that was significant and they weren't small numbers. It was almost close to a million dollars a year uh, in revenues that we were able, or expenses that OPEX that we were able to return to the business. So the business is much happier. They, they got more bandwidth. They got a, a very agile network, uh, one that you know helped them deploy a, a retail application across North America in a very rapid fashion uh, and a savings as well. So it was, it was a win across the board. So last slide. This is kind of one I wanted to, to show you. Um, 
we started our journey on 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 redefining or recreating uh, retail stores for for uh, Columbia Sportswear about 18 months ago, um, and that started with a decision to move to Mi Microsoft Dynamics uh, and uh, go to a cloud model completely. Um, during that process, um, interestingly enough, and, and probably uh, one of the more uh, uh, it happens uh, is the infrastructure team was left out of the process. So we came in late uh, and uh, the company came in and said, hey, we're gonna deploy this application uh, starting in, in April. And we're like, that's great, it's October. Um, how are we gonna do this when we haven't even been part of the planning? So uh, we rapidly gathered a team, uh, a team of, of core of three folks, stuck them in a room. Uh, they, they teamed up with some people from our retail team and they started doing sprints to basically design out um, and then work out all the automation pieces and um, went through six sprints, um, got ready to deploy it, did a lot of POCs. And then finally we started deploying in the spring, um, major deployments, uh, almost 10 to 15 a night, uh, walked that through until um, just about September. And then um, on September, we finished 141 locations in North America and did not have to use our contingency at all. We hit our dates. Uh, and, and a lot of that was due to pre-planning. It was doing, done to POCs. It was done to automation. It was done to uh, the team and, and how they came together, team dynamics. Um, it was also done, you know, we found a good Sherpa. So uh, that helped us out a lot as well throughout the journey. Um, but all the things that, you know, you saw us uh, learn there, we use that in that process uh, and were able to succeed and, and you know, hitting our mark and not having to go into that contingency. And if you think about, uh, you know, a half a billion dollars of, of business riding on this and uh, what time is it right now? It's almost November. Our peak season is going to hit real, real soon. Uh, and we were able to hit that on time and not have to extend into uh, peak season. Pretty amazing journey. And uh, a lot of that was due to the work that we did up front uh, and, you know, moving to software to find networking. So cool. And I'll leave you with uh, two quotes. Um, sorry, they're not climbing quotes, they're Warren Miller quotes, but I think they're very apropos to the journey I've been on for the past few years. So thank you for your time.